Looking around the world today, you may wonder, how do we make sense of it all? There's so much news happening. You know, you hear it on the radio, you watch TV, you hear it from our government leaders, you hear it from our community leaders, and how do we determine what's true, what's honest, what's believable? Well, this series, Where Do We Go From Here, is uh, an attempt to really get to the heart of matters local. And by approaching local problems, we hope that this will have greater impact on the state, on the country, and who knows, this is a, a global telecast as well. So we hope that by providing a community model here on how to resolve problems, how to become better educated, how to reach agreements, we can begin to make progress towards the social issues which concern us all. So today we are having the pleasure and honor of our two police chiefs, uh, Chief uh, Alex Gamelgard from Grass Valley and Chief Tim Foley from Nevada City. Welcome to the program. Thank, thank you. you for having and, us. And thank you for being here. And this is the first <coughs> show in a series on homelessness. And what better way to start than talking with the two of you who deal with this issue on a daily, if not an hourly basis. And I'd like, if you wouldn't mind, to go into a little bit about your background, what got you into police work, and then what got you here. Sure. Um, I guess I'll go start. Ahead. So. Uh, as you mentioned, um, I'm with the Grass Valley Police Department. I started my full-time law enforcement career with the Grass Valley Police Department, but I think what's, uh, how you started off talking about local issues, local problems, and um, I think we're well suited to solve our problems locally. And um, for me, it's important because this is my hometown. This is where I grew up. Mm -hmm. So I um, spent my childhood just right here in Nevada City. I went to Deer Creek and Seven Hills schools and then on to Nevada Union. And I got involved in law enforcement mostly by chance while I was attending Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington. I'm actually um, major, majored in business administration with concentrations in finance and law and public policy. So that's not your traditional background for law enforcement. Um, for me, a friend of mine who did want to go into law enforcement his entire life asked me to come to a meeting uh, called Volunteers in Policing with the Spokane Police Department and I didn't have anything else going so I went along and joined them and um, the rest is kind of history from there. I became a reserve officer for Spokane, Washington while I was going to college. Um, knew that I wanted to come back to my hometown. <coughs> Started at the Grass Valley Police Department and now I've been the chief there for uh, almost two years now. And how long with the department in total? Um, right around 13 years with Grass Valley. So it's great that you have uh, a lot of life experience here. You really know the community. Yeah, and I think that's important. Um, police work is portable, though, um, from community to community, but at the same time, uh, from a functional standpoint, but understanding your community uh, is important as well, and just there's some nuances on how different police departments police based on, on their communities. And building rapport, the fact that you know a lot of people know you, have known you mm -hmm. growing up, it helps to build trust, which is the kind of thing that may not exist in communities. Yeah, sometimes that can help for sure. And then it can also make, uh, from a police perspective, things difficult when you're dealing with um, long-term relationships and always having to do the right thing, which sometimes is the difficult thing. Mm -hmm. uh, about you, Chief Foley? Well, uh, my journey's a little different. Uh, I uh, born and raised in San Francisco. So I have a big city background. Uh, I joined the San Francisco Police Department back in 1977. And uh, it was tumultuous years, the 70s, mm -hmm. and uh, there were a lot of things, inroads being made into uh, police agencies and, and business and that kind of thing with uh, women and minorities coming into play into mm -hmm. the into the uh, fold of the police agencies at that time. And, and uh, so I, I saw a lot of change going on at that point in time and, and uh, I ended up partnering with a uh, woman officer uh, and uh, she ended up breaking her back on duty and retired up here and that was early on maybe five years into my career and uh, her and her husband came up here so my connection with Nevada City and the surrounding areas has been long term but on a short basis because I would come up three four times a year to visit her and her mm -hmm. husband and and uh, 
loved the place, always enjoyed our stay here, and uh, she said that at one point, she goes, yeah, if the chief of police job ever opens up in Nevada City, you should apply. She says, you'd be perfect. And uh, as fate would have it, the job opened up and I did apply. And kind of piggybacking off what Alex said earlier about uh, taking things from different jurisdictions and they apply to other places, uh, I think is very true. I mean, uh, obviously the magnitude of it in San Francisco is a lot different when we talk about homelessness and crime and those kind of things, but those kind of dynamics also play out in cities like Grass Valley or in Nevada City, and I think, you know, the experience I gained, uh, I was in San Francisco for 33 years, and uh, the experience I gained seeing a lot of different things and looking at different avenues to address issues help out here because mm -hmm. a lot of the things that we're trying here have been tried in various fashions in San Francisco and I'm sure in other jurisdictions too. So um, I've been here now four years uh, and I uh, enjoy the area as much mm -hmm. as I ever have and, and uh, I was fortunate to come here because I did know some people from my connections with you know, my partner and her husband and stuff. So there, there wasn't an unfamiliarity with it, but you know, I can't replace what you know, Alex having been here for such a long time. Mm -hmm. But I think the connections you make and building that bridge of trust and understanding, I think, is important moving forward. That must have been a big change from the big city, you know, to the small town. Um, but in a lot of ways, the city is much further, deeper, and ahead of the homeless issue there than here. I'm, I'm kind of interested in the contrast that you observe moving from there to here. Well, I, you know, I think, you know, there are a lot of social services that are readily available, but the, the problems are still the same. You know, you have uh, people that are homeless uh, because of financial circumstances. You have people that are on the street because they have mental health issues or drug or alcohol issues, and they can't keep things together enough to sustain themselves in a typical fashion, you know, being in a home, having a job, you know, and uh, being self-sustaining, and they fall into this pattern. Um, and, uh, you know, we're looking for ways to move people out, and, and uh, there's our rewards uh, that are set up for with people that have successfully gone through uh, processes mm -hmm. or uh, things that they've taken advantage of to correct uh, issues that they have, and their success stories. There's success stories here in Grass Valley in Nevada City. Living in San Francisco for 33 years as uh, in the police force and then coming to Nevada City must have been a big transition for you. What did you see that was similar or different in, in your job? Well, there's a lot of similarities between San Francisco and Nevada City, and, and uh, I worked a lot of years in the Haight-Ashbury area of San yeah. Francisco, so you kind of flow into that <laughs> kind of mode a little bit uh, with Nevada City, and it's an eclectic mix of people, and uh, they all get along, and, um, you know, but along the lines of, you know, policing, I think, you know, the, uh, the issues are the same. You know, there's more of things in San Francisco than there are in Nevada City or in Grass Valley, but the issues that are confronted day in, day out by officers are very similar. And when you get, you know, the, the homeless, there's a number of resources in San Francisco to, to uh, help uh, homeless individuals. Uh, and uh, here, you know, I think the resources are, are uh, slight uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, but the need is still there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we would see not only in San Francisco, but here, you know, a variety of people that are homeless for a number of different reasons. And, and that could be anywhere from losing a job and be just living on the edge economically to, uh, you know, drug or alcohol dependence or mental health issues, you know, the, those kind of things. And then, you know, we do see a group of people that float in and float out at uh, various points in time that give the impression of being homeless because they'll live off the land. Uh, so they kind of add to the perception of a lot of homeless individuals, but really they aren't. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you have to look at, you know, where people come from, what the issues are, and then address those issues specifically through whatever vehicle we can. And so we, you know, we work hand in hand with various agencies, you know, not only in San Francisco, but, but here you work, work hand in hand. And, you know, here, I mean, I only have 10 people, 10 officers mm -hmm. and, and some other staff, but San Francisco, you have 2,000 people. 
So there's there's a difference, but the volume that you deal with in, in uh, a larger city is greater. Do you find that there's much difference summertime, wintertime? Because I would imagine there's a migration here. The weather's good in summer, not so good in winter. You want to go? I, I, yeah. I, <laughs> Not, not as much as you might think. I mean, we are not what we would consider probably a friendly climate um, in western Nevada County to be homeless, hence the reason why there's a lot of discussion in our community about uh, warming shelters and daytime day centers and places where people can go to get out of the weather. Um, you know, very different than, say, Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. right? But at the same time, we don't see a mass exodus of homeless folks in the winter time because the conditions are so harsh. Mm. Um, rather, we find that um, a, a large number of our homeless population in this area are people that have some sort of tie to this community, whether it's family or grew up here or whatever it may be. And so this is home to them, and so they, they remain here regardless, and they find ways to you know, essentially survive, which then leads us to some other concerns in the summer months because camping in the woods is not necessarily right. a good thing um, right. when we have fire season. It's not good for the environment. It's not good for the individuals living in those conditions. Um, but from our experience, uh, we don't see a huge change mm -hmm. in population throughout the year. One thing we do see, and I'm sure Chief Foley can speak to a little bit, is we do see, see an influx of folks in the fall related to a particular industry right. that occurs in this area. Right. Um, and we're not totally unique to that too. There's other communities right. in Northern California that see that as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, one of the things that's often been said uh, as a criticism is that w number one, well, if we make it too comfortable for people, they'll come here uh, uh, as, a, as a, you know, um, hospitable community. Uh, but um, what I've heard it pretty much goes along with what you're saying that a lot of people who are homeless have ties here uh, as opposed to the general impression, well, you know, there's, there's no connection. So. Yeah, I think that what uh, Chief Gamelgard was saying is that they, uh, the core group of homeless people that are here do have ties to the community and there are, you know, s certain people that float in and out, you know, during the trimming season and uh, they're, they're not hardcore, the long-term homeless that, you know, you really want to uh, take care of. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, uh, the focus needs to be on those individuals and um, dealing with them and addressing their issues. Um, and through the various social service agencies that we have or mental health agencies, you know, we need to uh, look at them. And, and the concept of, you know, build it, you're just going to attract more people. Uh, I understand that's out there and it's a fine line to, to go through that. But um, and I think that uh, the, there is a need here to have uh, housing, mm -hmm. you know, to have sustenance, but also in conjunction with providing those kind of services are uh, the other resources to get people either into jobs, into substance abuse treatment, into mental health assistance. You know, those kind of things need to go hand in hand with that. Um, and I think that uh, we're moving in that direction. I think there's a lot of good things that are currently in play. You know, with the county and, and uh, with the two cities, I think there's a lot of good things that are in the works right now. What, um, what I've seen uh, is that uh, there are folks who are homeless and are the most vulnerable, chronically uh, ill or um, uh, mentally uh, challenged, the kind of thing. And, and then there are folks that are um, working, sort of like the working poor who don't have a, uh, a home and who, and I'm wondering, you know, I'm seeing that elsewhere in California where that element of the population uh, who just can't find affordable housing is growing. I'm wondering what, how that looks to you. I think that um, affordable housing, um, housing in general, the, I think that the demand for housing is much higher than the supply that we have, particularly in our, our area here locally. Um, and, and in California as a whole, West Coast more so than maybe some other areas. Um, but there, there are definitely different subsets of the large word homeless um, and, and how we go about addressing uh, individuals' needs in order to move them in a pathway to recovery, um, whether recovery is recovery out of homelessness is a house or if it's drug addiction or mental illness or co-occurring of both and what's causing the homelessness in the first place um, needs to be tailored. W one plan won't fit 
all. So mm -hmm. we need to be looking at this from a holistic perspective and housing is definitely a, a significant component of that. Um, you may have seen, I mean, Grass Valley for the first time in going on almost a decade is having its um, a housing industry that's coming back a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just did the ribbon cutting on a, a place up on Ridge Meadows, but the, right. the price for those homes is not something that's attainable right. for somebody that you just mentioned that's mm -hmm. kind of on the edge financially. So, uh, but at the same time, by increasing housing stock like that, we may start seeing migration occur. Of course, one small development won't necessarily fix that, but it's, so that's one piece. Uh, we have to talk about the treatment components. We need to provide um, targeted, um, targeted interventions for folks. Um, law enforcement plays a role in that, but so the social services and working together to try and plug people into services that's specific to their needs. So there's a lot, mm -hmm. there's a lot going on there. It's a big conversation. I think what we need to do is formulate a conversation in our community about what's the community standard. You know, maybe Nevada County needs to be talking about we are a community on a way to recovery, whatever that looks like. And here's our community standards on what that looks like. Here's what it is okay to do. Here's what it's okay, not okay to do. And then all of our decisions need to be focused through that lens. And then I think we can get somewhere. For a while though, we've kind of been kind of all over the board. Yeah. This, is, this is a great place to take a break and to come back and to address exactly what you're talking about. The community standards, expectations, the kinds of treatment that uh, can, we can look forward to. So let's do that, take a bit break, and we'll be back in a couple minutes. Keep moving, no loitering here. Her eyes were just like my mom's. Let's buy him a one-way bus ticket out of here. When did you get a job? When did you get a job? When did you get a job? I turned the corner when I realized people care. We want to work with you to build bridges. You are filthy, disgusting, stupid. Just love them. Now I see funny, intelligent, and witty. He's my best friend. He's with me 24-7, keeps me warm. He's my dog. I am not a lowlife. I'm just homeless. We are them, and they are us. We are one. And we all need a place to call Home. Story connects us to our humanity. The humanities, arts, and media communicate those stories. The result is cultural transformation. Inside the shell of addiction, filth, mental illness, and anger, sometimes buried very deep, there is joy, there is creativity, there is humanity. When we hear the stories of the broken and damaged people, we remember they are not separate from us. They are someone's family member, a citizen, a person. They are us, and we are them. We are one. And we all need a place to call home. This series is made possible by the generous donation of Stiefel Financial and viewers like you. Thank you. We're picking up our discussion with Chief Gamelgard from Grass Valley and Chief Foley from Nevada City, and it's uh, coming back to the idea of community standards, setting up expectations that a community can agree upon and the resources can be focused on, and then also the idea of leadership and how do we maintain a focus and a plan. Yeah. Well, I think we were talking off camera a little bit. Um, the focus and the leadership, I think, are essential to move the 
uh, move us in a positive direction. You know, right now things are very scattered, and, and what we're seeing are a lot of individuals, not nonprofits, and just you know, uh, individual citizens are taking it upon themselves to fill needs that they're seeing, uh, and some of it uh, violates community standards. Some of it are violating permit I permitting issues, sanitation issues, those kind of things. So well-meaning people are going out on a limb to address an issue that's countywide and uh, or nationwide. And I think we need to take kind of the, the reins in control of this and get these well-meaning people and have them work in a positive direction within community values and community structure. So I think you know the leadership aspect needs to be there uh, and the focus needs to be there. And, and like Alex mentioned earlier, it's like, what is our focus? Where do we want to go? Yeah, I mean, we want to get, I mean, we know what, if you could end homelessness, that would be the ultimate goal. And there's, pro there's a lot of different ways to get there and different communities will be successful doing it different ways. And what works for Western Nevada County may not work for Palm Springs. Um, or maybe it would. So we could end up creating a model. Um, we may get pieces from other places, but I think philosophically we're a little bit scattered on exactly what we're looking to do. Uh, we know there's a huge number of components to this. Uh, we know there's a broad umbrella of homelessness and a lot of subsets of, of individuals, so there's a lot of different ways uh, to, to have success stories within those little subgroups, but you know, I think I mentioned this before, we just need to understand as a community what, there are certain things that we should say are just not the way we're going to do business. Right. Um, how does that get said? How does that get established and agreed upon? How do you see that kind of organization developing? Essentially, where do we go from here? Well, I think you know, community meetings and forums are a great way to uh, sort of start to address uh, the concerns that people have and where they see us going. Again, within the confine, we have confines of law to address um, and, and then look at best ways to address those. And then uh, I think the hard part is when people start falling outside what's the agreed upon values and focus and direction that they aren't supported by the whole and then they would they're given a path. Yeah, they're given a pathway back to falling within the confines of what's acceptable, but we can't continue to um, adapt the way we're doing things to allow an outlier to mm -hmm. do what it is they might want to do. Instead, it needs to be a little bit the other way around. And 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 I think that um, the county, um, with their recent development of the new position that Brendan Phillips is filling, has has created uh, momentum in that direction. Mm -hmm. I think that stands to be a very um, good position that could help lead that movement forward. He's doing a lot of great work right now with stakeholders and some coordinated entry work, um, looking at looking at a lot of these other components. You know, that's one good good step forward that we've taken. Um, I think that we can have those conversations like you're talking, he can help facilitate them, we as uh, police departments, because we see at the end of the day when somebody feels unsafe or somebody sees something that is so deplorable of a condition that they don't know what to do, they call us. And so we go out to sometimes these camps that um, are just atrocious in the way they've treated the environment, the fire safety, the, the conditions that these uh, uh, folks sometimes um, are having to live in or whatever whatever the reasons are. And um, I think we need to be able to tell those stories in our community and our community to then set up those confines of what is acceptable and then work within those. Yeah, and I, you know, I think when we go out, <clears throat> the, the the goal is not to arrest everybody that we come across. The goal uh, a lot of times is to find out the best path for these people to take to get them into the services they need. And uh, you know, uh, Brendan Phillips and uh, uh, you know his staff are really good at coming forward when we find someone who's in need of services. And sometimes our avenue is to take a person to jail. Mm -hmm. But the ultimate goal there is to pr get them hooked up with the services mm -hmm. so that they can move out of the condition that they're in. And it may take three or four times of mm -hmm. the only re uh, place we have to put them is jail. If we can't get them to 
you know, goes another direction. But that yeah. that's an avenue we do uh, take, and then we work with the district attorney, public defender, courts, to get them into uh, a, a suitable path to correct the issue that they're. And the only time they're landing in jail is if they're committing criminal. Committing acts, criminal. Which right. That's the broader concept of community standards, you know, state right. law. Right. But I think we can hone that yeah. in here locally. What, what I've observed and what I'm hearing now is that we're kind of at a crisis management level. And in order to get beyond that, we need a plan. We need somewhere where we're heading. We need something that we've agreed upon and leadership to define what that is so that we can take those steps. Is that pretty accurate? Yeah, I think that's, you know, the, and there's been efforts made by all the cities and the counties to move in that direction. It just, for whatever reason, it hasn't really grabbed hold yet. There's a lot of good concepts out on the on the table. There's a lot of good people that have been involved in this, and uh, I think you know it just needs to grab hold and start moving forward. But uh, you know, I think uh, if we have the will, there's enough good people that I think can make it work. Right. We're not talking about reinventing the wheel in some places. It's already experienced successes successes in communities, and mm -hmm. to some extent, we're you know, holding our own here, but I think what I'm hearing is we can do better. Yeah, and I think we're uniquely positioned here to um, really move forward. It, it's not like we don't have a number of folks and organizations mm -hmm. um, and passionate people. You know, it'd be one thing if you were lacking those mm -hmm. individuals and organizations. Mm -hmm. We'd be in a much worse position than we are now. We have the, the, the folks and the organizations and the services um, we're probably lacking some funding. I think that's something that we see in a lot of communities, though. Right. I mean, yeah. that's always a challenge, resources. But we're uniquely positioned to solve, to solve and or move this into a much better position than we are today. If we had to pull together all those resources first, then we would be even further behind. So I, I think that it's all manageable. So in, in sort of bringing the interview to a close, is there anything that you see, you know, where do we go from here? Is there anything in specific that you would like to see us take either within your uh, police force or within the city or within the community that you would kind of like to see happen? Uh, I think, you know, that right now continuing to work and build those bridges and that cooperative uh, spirit that already exists with us, you know, the police department, the nonprofits, the other uh, governmental agencies that do assist. Um, you know, I think just keep building on on that because there are a lot of good things and innovative uh, uh, concepts that are coming out of what's happening right now. Uh, I think looking at funding sources to get the funds that are necessary to move this forward, and then uh, you know, I think convening. Uh, meetings that would hone community expectations and community standards so that we know where we're going and uh, you know facilitating uh, it so that everybody's on the same page and moving forward I think mm -hmm. to me that's what needs to happen I think getting everybody on the same page knowing what that page is mm -hmm. is really important yeah I, I would agree with Tim on that I th I'm probably going further down the road than then maybe, um, and it might be a future conversation in those exact forums he's talking about, but I think that we need to say every action that we're taking in order to solve homelessness in our community is going to be based on the premise that we are going to be helping people recover from the state that mm -hmm. they've either found themselves in or they're in or uh, life has led them to. So we shouldn't be creating just spaces for individuals to, we shouldn't accommodate necessarily. I mean, there's a certain amount of that that is compassionate and is appropriate, but we can't build, there should be programs around those spaces, mm -hmm. whether it's 24 seven, mm -hmm. whether it's a day center, whether it's a warming shelter, whether it's um, uh, emergency housing, whether it's supportive housing, whether it's the, the housing first model, whether, you know, whatever it might be, it needs to have an eye towards helping people move onward and upward, not just creating space. Because right now, the space that is being created because of lack of other methods is folks camping in the woods, um,
people feeling unsafe, whether that's warranted or not. And often, oftentimes, uh, we do see that there's higher incidences of theft and criminal behavior in and around un, uh, unintervened homeless encampments. So as a community, people are feeling unsafe. And so us as chiefs, we're hearing that, feeling that, dealing with that. And the first, the, for us to move forward, people need to feel safe and a sense of pride in their community and not have conversations about how bad of a place this is, because let's face it, it's a wonderful place to live. Right. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. But we need to be, everything we do, and this is a community standard, I suppose, should be towards the recovery aspect of it. And that's my belief. Right, we know we can make it better. We right. just have to form our agreements and develop a plan. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Really appreciate your contributions, and um, I'm, I know you've got work to do. So no thanks again. Um, we'll be airing these shows uh, throughout the month of February on Monday nights, 7 p.m. each week. Hope you'll continue to watch. Thank you. <laughs>